Welcome to Shoalhaven Baptist Church. It's Sunday school time again. Don't the weeks just rush on by? Yes. Great enthusiasm for the Sunday school on Sunday morning. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome to you at home as well. Glad you could be with us if you're there at home. And we're going to continue on with our series on the biblical distinctives of Baptists. We've got a few more weeks to go, but we'll check a couple of things first. Okay, so last week I said to you I'd give you one more week to learn this memory verse. So how are you doing with it? You all good? Good. So let's just say this one time together and then we'll see if anyone who hasn't said it would like to say it to gain their chocolate-coated reward and then uh, we'll move on, all right? Okay, so together with me, you're right? Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. But godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry it. Nothing out. Oh dear, had a hiccup. Chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Had two hiccups <laughs> in between. All right, that'll be next time. But who would like to say the memory verse from last week? Okay, I think everyone who's done it has said it's going to say it or whatever. Is that right? All right, well, let's concentrate on our new memory verse. Good morning, ladies. So our new memory verse, there's some memory verse cards up on the back there. If uh, some of you need them, thank you. And we'll... Okay. Hand a couple of those out to those who need them. And we'll have a look at this. John chapter 20, verse 31. The memory verses that we learn are all important, of course. Um, this one's important like all the other ones. So let's get it down into our memories. All right, you ready to say it with me? Let's give it its designation and then we'll say the verse, all right? John chapter 20, verse 31. But these things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and the believing you might have life through his name. John chapter 30, verse 31. All right, want to say it again? Okay, let's do it, righto? John chapter 30, verse 31. But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that the believing you might have life through his name. Well, it looks... Verse 31. Looks like I've got an error. Oh, you can read it later. We'll be doing it next week. Don't worry. And so you can check up on it then. All right, let's go through and check our... Oh, where'd it go? There it is. It's back again. We need to learn the books of the Bible. And perhaps all of you know them. And perhaps some of you don't. I'm not sure. But every now and again you go, ah, where's that? Yes, where's Ecclesiastes? Well, it's in the Bible, okay? So let's say it together. We'll go through the whole lot. I'm hoping eventually that we'll get to know them. Does anyone know through, let's say, um, I know the tricky part in the Old Testament are the minor prophets, aren't they? All right. Does anyone know the Old Testament through to the minor prophets okay all right a few of you do does anyone know the minor prophets depending on the day <laughs> yeah okay okay so most of us know that bit and uh, the new testament we're usually pretty good on the new testament okay well, so we've got some of it right let's say it all together and we'll go with the old testament we'll start in genesis okay with me all right, let's do it. 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Judges, Rogers, Ruth, Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. Revelation's the last one. So that's good. Well done. Okay. You might know them. But it's good to know again. Good to practice these things. Okay, let's move on to biblical distinctives of Baptist. Okay, we need to remember Christ is the head and absolute authority in the local church and uh, should control its direction, proceedings and destiny. Also, we've talked about um, that uh, the local church is an autonomous body um, and all human authority for governing the local church resides within the local church itself. The local church is responsible only to the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God. In other words, we've got to take the Bible fairly seriously when we come to running our church. Now, a bit of revision, the first of two ordinances. Now, we've done a few things. What else have we done? Do you remember? What does the first B stand for? Biblical authority. Well said, young lady. And then after that came A, B, A. So what was the A for? Autonomy of the local church. Okay. Then we had P. What was P? Priesthood of the believer. Okay. And then we had T for the two ordinances. We talked about this one. Baptism. Um, the first of the two ordinances, okay, so baptism doesn't save people or make them more spiritual, but it's an important part of God's will for believers. Okay, so um, <coughs> baptism of believers by immersion in water is a biblical pattern, symbolises Christ's substitutionary death, burial and resurrection. It is a command of Christ to the church and publicly identifies an individual with Christ. Okay, so that was... Baptism, And then last week we did the second of those two ordinances, the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is a communion service. It uh, should be a time of fellowship with God and with other believers. And the Lord's Supper was instituted by Christ within the framework of the Passover Supper, proclaims Christ's substitutionary death for mankind. The cup symbolises his shed blood and the bread is broken body members of the local church should partake in worthy manner whilst considering his death and anticipating his return. Right, so we talked about all of that stuff. So, what do you think I might stand for? <laughs> it might stand for individual soul liberty if you've got your notes in front of you, you would already realise that, of course. <coughs> so, what do you think that might mean? What do you think that might mean? No, no. No. Okay. No, we need to get to the point. Um, so religious soul liberty means something else. So look, let's have a look. I want to just check one verse, okay? Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 13, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Let me, let me have a look at that. Just turn there. We're going to get to this passage of scripture a little later on as well, but 
Well, I think we will. Now, you all know where Galatians is because we just learned where it was in the Bible, didn't we? Okay, so Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 13 says this, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Liberty, okay, soul, um, <coughs> uh, individual, soul, liberty. Okay, So we'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. Okay. I'm going to get past that. Our verse here, Romans chapter 14, verses 5 and 12. One man esteemeth the day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. All right. So what are we talking about when we talk about individual soul liberty? Let's have a little bit of a look at a few things. Okay. So Baptists ought to promote their beliefs by persuasion and not by coercion. Okay. So one particular religious organisation and group is very known for trying to persuade people by coercion. And in some countries around the world today, if you don't say you believe what they believe and, you know, um, they're just going to kill you. Right? So you get two choices. And there are other groups that are very, not quite so brutal about it, but that are pretty well a bit that way. But we don't believe that that ought to be the way it is. Um, you ought to be able to persuade somebody of your beliefs, but we don't want to point a gun at the head and say, you know, you've got to believe what we believe or I'm going to kill you. you know, that's ridiculous. Well, I think it's ridiculous. So every individual, whether a believer or an unbeliever, has the liberty to choose what their conscience or soul dictates is right in the religious realm. However, this liberty is not justification for disobeying God. Right? So they can say, oh, I don't believe that. Well, that's fine. They don't have to believe it. But it still doesn't excuse them when they disobey God. God says you need to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour or else heaven is not your destination. Right? But if you choose that, then it's your issue, isn't it? Okay? Um, there's no justification for disobeying God. Okay? So every individual, whether they're a believer or an unbeliever, has the right to choose what their conscience decides is okay for them. And we can say that about all manner of things in life, can't we? But it doesn't always turn out well uh, because some people's conscience is somewhat disturbed. So, but this concept is known as individual soul liberty um, or religious liberty. And Baptists don't want to force anyone into uh, uh, believing or denying any particular doctrine. Um, we don't want to coerce people to worship God against their will or to stop them from worshipping um, you know, but we want them to do it right. And we do have that ability to explain to people. Right? Um, we're not going to steal your property or use other, or, you know, threaten to kill you or take your children off to some, um, what do they call them, um, re education camp. Okay. We do have camps. And perhaps they do re-educate. <laughs> yes, all right. But they're good fun. <laughs> we may not agree with uh, a person's uh, decision on a religious matter and that person's belief might be wrong even, according to the scriptures. Uh, but they still have the right to think that way. Uh, but we also have the right to attempt to persuade them to embrace the truth 
and that's what we need to have a little think about and a look at. Okay, so, so that's what I talked about. Okay, so um, we're opposed. Uh, we're we oppose error, and we ought to make an attempt to persuade others to embrace biblical truth. So, that's individual soul liberty. Okay, so let's have a, a look at some biblical indications of individual soul liberty. Okay, from Genesis to Revelation, God calls people to submit to him and he gives them freedom of choice. How do I know that? Sorry? Whosoever will. That's right. Whosoever will. So what we've got is, um, you know, you don't have to, but if you do, good. What happened in the Garden of Eden? I mean, there's the first instance. God said to Adam and Eve, there's a tree in the middle of this garden, don't want you to eat it, don't want you to eat it, the fruit of that tree, because when you do, you're going to die. No. Adam and Eve hung around for a little while, we don't know how long. Satan came along and said, ah, don't worry about that, be all right. And so they chose. How would it have been if God had said to them, I will prevent you always from doing that. You will never be able to do that. You'll never be able to even look at that tree. It's there, but you won't be able to even look at it. Um, I'm not going to let Satan uh, be involved in your, your life in any way at all. I'm going to keep you perfectly pure and safe and whatever and whatever <coughs> it may have meant that sin never entered into the world but it may also mean would have meant that you and I didn't have a choice in life right? and while sometimes it would be nice to think wouldn't it be wonderful if we didn't ever have to sin or well, we don't have to sin but if we never could sin but then what would we be We'd be probably robots or we'd be God, you know. So God's given us that opportunity to make our, our choice. And all the way through the Bible, you see people making choices and you see sometimes they're good choices and sometimes they're bad ones and sometimes they work out all right and sometimes they don't. And yeah, it's the story of the Bible all the way through. So um, we can see it's there. Since the time of Christ, various professing Christian groups have used Old Testament examples to justify religious persecution without noting the difference between Israel and the church. Now, I say that and I want to explain something to you. Right? We're going to read some scripture. So grab your Bible, we're going to be in the Old Testament. When we look at Old Testament Israel, um, they were a people, a, a nation organised with God as its ruler. It was a theocracy, all right? So we see that there was much control there um, exercised by God and he limited very many practices. And so <clears throat> I want you to have a look at a couple of verses. So we'll start over on this side because I started on that side last week. So Nathan, you're going to be first cab off the rank. Okay, so Exodus chapter 31, <clears throat> verse 14. We're going to have a look at that. And then Exodus 35, verse 2. Okay, perhaps whoever's next, yep. And after that, we're going to go to Leviticus. I'll tell you these again. So whoever's next is going to do Leviticus 20, verse 27. And then I want someone to do Leviticus 24, 16. Uh, where are we up to? Up the back there somewhere. And where do I get to? Leviticus. After that's Deuteronomy. Okay, so I want Deuteronomy 17. And we'll do uh, verse 2 on for a bit, maybe to verse 5. And Deuteronomy 13, verse 6 on for a little bit. All right? So what I'm going to show you here is this example. I hope I'm going to show you that. 
All right, so who's first up with Exodus 31, verse 14? Thank you, Nathan. <coughs> Okay, and ver uh, 35, verse 2. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you a holy day, the Sabbath of rest to the Lord. This also do with work therein shall be put to death. Okay, so what are those passages talking about? Keeping the Sabbath, right? If you don't keep the Sabbath, you die, right? Uh, that's fairly autocratic, isn't it? I mean, that's kind of taken away a bit from we wouldn't like that today would we don't go to church you die <laughs> okay hang on a minute <laughs> hang on i need to get to uh sarah i think um sarah you're going to read for me uh, leviticus chapter 20 and verse 27 is that right okay thank you Okay, so if you practice the, anything in the occult, you know, go to a fortune teller or anything like that, I don't know what we'd call today those kind of things. Maybe, yes, thank you. <laughs> Stay there for a minute. Um, but if you do those things, you get put to death. Right? Not, I'm not saying you should do that. Don't, don't read that, but it does take away from our liberty a bit, doesn't it? Okay. All right. Okay, now hang on, hang on, hang on. No, I've got to get someone else to read Leviticus 24, verse 16. Who was that? Yep. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well the stranger as he that is born in the land. Okay, anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall be put to death. There would be a whole lot of dead people on building sites everywhere. Okay. No. Okay, that's that's en enough for that one. Okay, so <coughs> if you blaspheme in the name of the Lord, you're going to die. We probably all would be dead. Mm. Think about it. All right. So um, after uh, we got to that one, um, so who am I up to? Um, who was, uh, have I done Leviticus 20, uh, 24? Uh, Deuteronomy, okay, Deuteronomy 17 and verses 2 through 5. It's a bit of a wade, isn't it? Um, let me have a look and see. We probably, oh, it's not too bad. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Yep. Go off worshipping some other god, some other something, you know, and you're dead. All right? So, again, 
we see here there's no opportunity. I'm sure people did do that, but there's, you know, if we carried that out to the letter of the law, there'd be no opportunity for sole liberty, would there? Okay? So these kind of things happen. Now, what was the last one? It was uh, 13. Deuteronomy 13, I think. Is that right? Who was reading that one? Okay, thank you. Um, 6 through 10. 6, did you say? 6, yep. yep. January 6 to 10. Okay, pretty severe stuff if you decide to leave the independent Baptist church that you now attend and, <coughs> and go off down the road to the Mormon tabernacle. I'm not suggesting you do that. Please don't. <laughs> but pretty severe, eh? Mm. So, but this was a situation that Israel um, lived under and... So it was a theocracy, that, you know, and it was different. And we need to realise that that was a different time. You know, that, that's church. We live in the church age, you know, the age of grace. And it is different uh, to that. And, but some churches, some people still want to bring about these kind of um, rules and laws about things and it's not quite right. We don't want you to head off in the wrong direction spiritually. But since the time of Christ, various professing, groups, professing Christian groups have uh, have tried to do things like that and uh, bring about religious persecution. Even in the early days of America, you know, we might look at America and see it as being a very godly nation. Well, it's falling from it a bit now, but very early days in America. If, if and in England, if you didn't have a license to preach, well, they'd throw you in jail. And, and if you wanted to baptise somebody, as we would call baptism, they'd throw you in jail, or they'd fine you, they'd confiscate your your lands, uh, in because you disagreed with what the state said. And all of those kind of things have happened but ought not happen. Okay? Um, uh, we need to remember that there is a distinct difference between Israel and the church. The theocracy of Israel existed during the dispensation of the Mosaic law, right? Time of law. <coughs> we live in the age of grace, the church age. So it's different. And just as God has abolished the system of animal sacrifices, which existed in that time, so we can understand that um, there has been a change also in the way of worship and, and lots of other things. And therefore we look to the New Testament for indications of individual soul liberty and we'll see them. All right, so let's have a little look at a couple of things. Okay, An example of individual soul liberty, uh, we had that in our memory verse, didn't we? One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Every man be fully persuaded of his own mind. Right? So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Right? So we have a look in that passage of scripture there in Romans. What we see is uh, Paul mainly speaking about food, things that they were eating. Um, 
I'll find it because it's not opening automatically, of course, on the right page. Okay. Um, what am I looking for? He talks about uh, a number of those kind of things um, um, about making uh, a choice and says let, in verse 13 he says, let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in a brother's way. All right. So he was talking about a number of, of various issues and um, individual soul liberty of believers was was here. Um, Paul saying, just because this guy happens to think that, you know, you ought to do this on this day or eat this or drink that and you don't, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're right or he's right, um, but sometimes we need to do that. Um, Verse 5 says, For one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now there are groups and organisations who believe that meeting on another day other than Sunday is the absolute thing that you have to do. There are those that believe that Saturday is the day and in fact believe that people like you and I might be cursed or be inspired by the devil or something because we worship on Sunday. I mean, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. So, Christians set aside a day, a special day, and we worship on Sundays. What was the day that Christ rose from the grave? Might have been a Sunday. The first first time the Lord's Day. The first time he met with his disciples after his resurrection was a Sunday. So it's the Lord's Day. We'll stick with that. Okay. Um, so Paul doesn't recommend as perhaps the Old Testament does that one person be punished and, a, a, and another one not because they have a differing belief but what he's saying is that you know um, you need to be pu fully persuaded that what you are doing is right. And you need to check the scriptures and make sure it is. And that's individual soul liberty, allowing the individual Christian to take um, the freedom to choose what they believe is best. And um, when the issue uh, is a matter of right and wrong, the Christian approach is to exhort people to do what's right, but not to coerce, not to force. And the underlying reason for that is uh, found in that verse 12 there. So then every one of us shall give account to himself of God. We are accountable. Right? We will be accountable. Your place in heaven is secure. But there'll be some rewards to be won or lost. And we will be accountable for the things that we do. So we find that also in 2 Corinthians um, 5.10. Um, which states that uh, every believer one day will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give account of himself, themselves, okay? So the other thing to think about is nobody is responsible for somebody else's free will um, movement, okay? No person is responsible for the free will actions of another. Therefore, we have no right to force others to believe as we do, but we should attempt to persuade them follow biblical truth right? so I'm not responsible for the choices that you make in your free will okay? you are before God responsible for those things okay? if I mislead you, misguide you um, and coerce and persuade you to do something that's wrong then, and you follow that then that becomes another issue but if you've made a free choice um, I'm not responsible for that free choice and you're not responsible for my free choices either. So, but we need to attempt to persuade each other of what's right. right? Um, and the Bible gives a good clue about that. Okay? So, there's some questions that might come out of that for us as uh, 
Independent Baptist Church, um, do we as a church have the right to accept or reject people to church membership? Well, we do. If you don't want to believe what we as a church state that we believe, and it's all there for you to be, to be seen, then we could say to you, no, you shouldn't be a member of, of this church because you don't believe the same as we believe and we have that, that right uh, to do that. Um, and you might then ask, why doesn't this policy violate the principle of soul liberty? Well, because the members have agreed on the constitutional, the doctor, doctrinal position uh, of the church, uh, of the way of administration and so on, and no one's forced to accept that. But if you don't want to accept it, then perhaps you don't want to be um, a member. You don't want to join. When you, you're you not going to want to join... Um, you know, the football club and then take your cricket bat along, are you? No, no. Not even the most keen amongst you who are cricketers are going to take the cricket bat to the football um, or the golf club, for that matter. I know there are a few keen golf players around the place, but you understand what I mean, all right? I hope you do understand what I mean. Okay, let's have a look at the boundaries of individual soul liberty. Okay, one of the boundaries of care for individuals. Right? So we need to be careful uh, and be think about other people right, when we're considering this. All right, um, soul liberty is not a justification for disobeying scriptures and we we need to make sure that we do take care of others. It doesn't allow me to make a choice that um, affects you badly, okay? Um, yeah, I think that's probably where we go with that, okay? So, the local church, okay? So, that's another boundary here of individual soul liberty. Um, we need to be careful about that, um, about the church and the church's position um, as we think about what we're going about our choices and what we, de what we decide to do. And how about the scripture? That's pretty important. The scriptures ought to guide us in all the things that we do in our life doesn't mean the scriptures have, you know, scriptures don't tell us everything about what we need to do in our life, but they give us outlines of our, the way we ought to think and do. Um, they don't give us instruction about, you know, what meal we should have this evening. You don't look up, you know, the menu in the front of the Bible and figure out what you're going to eat for dinner tonight. Is it going to be Chinese? Or, or are you going to Macca's or um, will you cook a steak at home? Um, this is not there. These are decisions that we can make. But it has a lot to say about, about life. Um, individual soul liberty doesn't mean we can do whatever we want to do without regarding others. And the scriptures lay out and the Bible lays out for us how we ought to deal with others. You know, to, to love each other, to care for each other. Okay? And so others' liberty is really important, isn't it? Um, we ought not make decisions that, you know, bring constraint upon that. As we look at this a little bit more, okay? Individual soul liberty is not a justify, not a justification for disobeying scripture. Um, we're free, we say. I can make whatever choices I like. Yeah, you can. But it doesn't justify you disobeying God's word. 
You can do it, but it doesn't justify it. And it does not mean a, a believer can do whatever they want without regard for others. You know, we do need to regard each other. You know, um, we're a church family, a congregation of believers together, and we need to consider one another. We need to pray for one another. We need to um, help one another in times of need. And there's lots of stuff like that. And the Bible just tells us that's what we need to do. And it doesn't make each Christian a law unto themselves. I'm saved. I can do whatever I like. Still going to heaven. Well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but it's not a good way to live your life, is it? And it doesn't permit a believer to disregard others' liberty. So what I do ought not prevent you from having liberty to do what you decide that you should do. So it doesn't permit us to uh, deny others an opportunity of uh, making their own choices. Um, we exercise our own choice ourselves if we prevent someone else from exercising their choice that it might be called hypocrisy, mightn't it? So we have to be just a little bit careful about those things. All right, so there we are. Tricky little subject, perhaps. Um, any questions about that? Okay. Might be. Okay, in the, every individual, whether a believer or an unbeliever, has the liberty to choose what they might, what their conscience or soul dictates is right in the religious realm. All right. So that's what we're talking about. And all Christians need to have their thinking challenged by biblical truths relating to individual soul liberty. So we need just to think about it. And Paul says quite a lot about it in that chapter of Romans, Romans 14. All right, no further questions? Very good. Let's have a word of prayer and then we can go and have a, a break, have morning tea. Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of soul liberty. Lord God, that we uh, have the opportunity to make decisions regarding our religious conduct and belief. And uh, Heavenly Father, uh, some things are right and some things not. Uh, Lord, guide us in those things that are right and uh, help us, Lord, to uphold the principles that you've laid out for us in the scripture. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.